Welcome to another episode of Bike Radar Builds, the video series in which we give you, our wonderful YouTube audience, a closer look at some of the most interesting bikes the Bike Radar team are riding at the moment. You join me here in sunny South Bristol, but we'll also be traveling via the magic of video editing to join my lovely colleagues, Warren and Matthew, for a close look at two of their most interesting full bongo bikes. I'm also going to tell you about this bike behind me. And while it's no mega expensive superbike, it has been customized to within an inch of its life. Before we get started though, if you've watched any of the previous episodes in this series, you may remember us asking you to share your pictures of your bikes with us using the hashtag BikeRadarBuilds. So stick around to the end of the episode where we'll be sharing a few of our favorite builds and don't forget to keep sharing your pictures with us using the hashtag BikeRadarBuilds for a chance to be featured in a future episode. This is my Planet X Exocet 2 time trial bike. Some of you may recognize it for a feature that I wrote on bikeradar.com last year, but the eagle-eyed among you will notice that it's had a few tasty upgrades since then. Now, the majority of this bike was built before I joined Bike Radar, and so the point of it was to be as fast as possible without spending much money. Of course, since I've joined the Cycling Illuminati, that's kind of gone out the window a little bit, but ultimately, it's still a pretty cheap bike when you actually add everything up. The most recent upgrade I've made to it are the new wheels. Now, it's a prime 85mm black edition carbon front wheel with a prime 343 carbon full rear disc wheel. Whilst these are very fancy wheels, they're actually not that expensive and the whole set comes in just over a thousand pounds at RRP, but you can often find these wheels discounted online. As mentioned, the front wheel is 85 millimeters deep, it has an internal width of 20 millimeters and an external width of 28 millimeters. It's also tubeless ready, as is the rear disc wheel, although I'm only running the front tire tubeless at the moment. What I'm hoping is, is that the front wheel will be slightly more aerodynamic than the previous 50 millimeter wheel I had, but the extra external width also gives me the license to run a slightly wider tire, which is great because the roads that we have to race on in England aren't usually that good. As mentioned, only the front wheel is set up tubeless and on that front wheel I've got a Vittoria Corsa Speed, the first generation, but it's still a really good tire. On the rear, I've got a Continental GP5000 clincher with a latex tube. Another big change that I've made, although it's arguably a bit more subtle, is that I've recently moved from 172.5 mm cranks right down to 165 cranks for this bike. I noticed that when riding the time trial bike, there was around a 10 to 15 watt difference at FTP compared to riding my road bike. Now, I have a hunch that that was probably due to the tighter hip angle that the 172.5 mm cranks were creating on this time trial bike. So, after talking to a few bike fit experts, I decided to give shorter cranks a try. Now, it's probably a bit early to say whether I'm going to be able to claw back all of that missing horsepower, but I'll let you know in a future video. I love a big chain ring. It's more efficient because it means the chain doesn't have to bend in such extreme angles. And on this bike, I've got a lovely set of Rota 56 tooth, 42 tooth chain rings. As I said at the start, the frame is a Planet X Exocet 2 time trial bike. It's quite an old frame now, and I got it pretty cheap in the sale around 2014, 2015. I don't even think that, you know, they sell it or make it anymore. It's not a fancy frame. Let's be honest, but it kind of does the job. It's got pretty aerodynamic tube shapes. It takes standard rim brakes, which is, which is kind of what I wanted because I didn't want to have to faff with aero hidden brakes that made changing wheels or, you know, slowing down kind of complicated. So I could get a better bike if I had money to spend, but I don't really feel like dropping 5,000 pounds on a Trek Speed Concept or a Cervelo P5 or, you know, whatever. The handlebars are actually a set of generic carbon time trial handlebars that I brought off AliExpress.com. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go out and do the same thing because obviously, if I had had any problems, I wouldn't have really had any kind of warranty support or anyone to turn to. One thing I have added to the handlebars is a set of angled spacers by UK-based company AeroCoach. Now, these are really useful for tilting the extensions up and giving you a more comfortable and hopefully more aerodynamic position than would normally be possible. 
I also have an ISM Adamo attack saddle and I find a time trial specific saddle to be really, really important. It's vital that when you're leaning forward and rolling your hips forward, you don't have any kind of pain or pressure on sensitive areas. Otherwise, you just won't be able to hold that aero position. So top tip, get a time trial specific saddle for your aero bike or time trial bike. I'm also running an immersive wax chain, which means I've stripped off all the grease from it and kind of put it in a slow cooker with a mixture of paraffin wax and PTFE and a kind of couple of other friction modifiers. Finally, what I like to say about this bike is it's both the heaviest and the fastest bike that I own. Now, it weighs 9.21 kilos, which if I was to come onto this channel with an aero race bike and tell you it weighed 9.21 kilos, I suspect most of you would say, oh, it's too heavy for a race bike. But I guarantee you, this is the fastest bike that I own. Aerodynamics is what matter. And really, unless you're climbing mountains, weight just isn't that important. Sorry, guys. So that's my Planet X Exocet 2 time trial bike. Is there anything that you would change? Is there anything that you think I could add to make it just a little bit faster? If so, leave a comment below because I really want to know about it. I'm Warren Rossiter. I'm a senior technical editor for all things road here at Bike Radar, and I'm going to walk you through my giant TCR Advanced SL. Now this is the 2018 model, so it's not the new Aero Optimized 2021 model that we're seeing everywhere at the moment. Now originally this TCR was my long-term test bike, but with this one it was a little bit more of a different project for me. Um, I got it in as a frame set and then I wanted to just put it together um, and build up a bike that I would be really, really happy with. Now the usual thing with any long-term bike is that once you've had it for that year or whatever, um, it then needs to go back. And when Giant contacted me and said, you know, you're time's up this bike needs to go back um, my reply to them was can you just send me the bill I mean I couldn't really imagine not having this bike yeah it's just got everything that, that I think you, you need from this sort of bike this sort of you know high performance fast bike um, but it just suits me so well so I'll walk you through what I've built it up with and and hopefully give you some of the reasons why the bar is Visions Metron 4D uh, now this is a really nice shape of bar, it's one I really really like, um, in fact it's, it's a kind of a modern update of one of my favourite all time bars which was the original FSA K-Wing. It's got a bit more of an aero profile on it but it's got that kind of specialised like uh, hover bar design so the actual tops here just lift that little bit further up from, from the stem eye. Then moving on to the stem, just a classic zip service course SL, just really like these stems, um, super stiff, really nice and light and with this new uh, for this year model you can actually buy this this add-on faceplate um, which gives you a really good fixed point for your Garmin nice and in line keeps everything looking nice and clean the drivetrain on this bike it's SRAM Red ETAP not the new 12-speed axis stuff this is the you know the original classic 11-speed first wireless group out there I, I like the simplicity of everything going on with it you know that sort of right click makes things harder left click makes things easier click them both together you change at the front just so so simple so easy to set up so easy to maintain moving on to the wheels these are zips um 202 nsws you know it zips shoulder shallowest rim they're tubeless they're nice and light they roll really fast the wheels on this bike do chop and change occasionally especially if i've got plenty of wheels on test it's it's just a good platform to to, to test wheels this bike chassis is so nice and stiff you can really feel what the wheels are doing so moving on to the brakes, again, SRAM red, but I have made a couple of changes there. I've moved over to Swiss stop rotors and Swiss stop pads. These do seem to be a little bit of a step up uh, and actually well worth the money. Moving on from that, saddle, big fan of the kind of the short saddle designs, you know, starting out with the original Specialized Power. Um, and for a long, long time, this bike was running a power, um, but now I've kind of settled down with fabric. Um, you know, fabric, really good little brand. They make some really, really nice saddles and this new short saddle from them, is excellent it's so so comfortable and actually it's really really well priced with it um, so that's another one I'd really recommend tires wise I'm running Continental's GP 5000 TL they're easy to fit they maintain their pressure really well they're super fast rolling um, and in 28s which is about as big as this bike can take uh, it just gives you that added level of comfort uh, a few years ago now I was lucky enough to go out to to Denmark to visit ceramic speed um, I was always a bit of a skeptic when it came to uh, ceramic bearings but you know I went there outfitted this bike so it's got ceramic BB um, ceramic bearings in the wheels as you can see I've upgraded to the ceramic speed oversized jockey and 
although it's really difficult to get any kind of exact data on it all, all i can say is that you know riding it out in denmark as soon as we fitted all the parts it, it immediately felt like a smoother bike this bike comes in at 7.5 kilos as you see it here so that includes the two cages that includes the pedals um includes the garmin mount strip all that off and um it's down around the six six point eight kilo mark which um it, to be honest is, is more than light enough for pretty much anything you never need you know considering this is this is a this bike for a big guy like me you know what would i finish off with well you know some people might sort of go oh I, you know it's got an isp so you can't move that seat post um does that make it a problem for travel well quite simply um i've never had an issue with it as i say i've taken this to denmark i've taken this to italy all in just a standard case and it fits now some of you might be thinking it's an old bike it's uh, it's not the current and flashiest one but you know i think when a bike is this good you don't need to be worrying about you know having the latest and greatest to be honest i can't imagine ever getting rid of it it's just um it does everything i need and because it was you know sort of put together by me and all the parts are selected because i like them um you'll never see another one like it and you know that's worth its weight in gold surely this is my on one pompino fixie and while i spend a lot of time riding very nice expensive new test bikes this is a bicycle that i actually own that has great sentimental value to me I bought this bike second hand over a decade ago when I lived in Edinburgh and used it to commute to various jobs and university and ride around town and do all of my shopping. I didn't own a car then. The Pompino is a bit of a British classic. It's sort of kind of cross bike-esque, but in this case, I've got a random carbon road fork on it, which I think the previous owner got from the back room of a bike shop. The frame is chromoly steel, which isn't particularly light but because it's a fixie the overall bike doesn't actually weigh that much. I don't actually know how much this thing weighs because it doesn't matter in the slightest. The rear wheel is very nice, it's a Mavic Open Pro rim, the old one, built on a Gold Tech fixed gear hub which is quite a fancy cool hub. The front wheel is the first wheel that I ever built for myself after I got my mechanic certificate and so has great sentimental value to me. It's an open pro rim as well. It's one of the grey anodized couche dur rims and it's built on a classic Shimano XTR hub, which is just lovely, buttery smooth and hopefully will last till long after I die. I like how much of a mishmash of parts this bike is and it's evolved gradually over time. When I rode it in Edinburgh, it had drop bars on it but I had a bit of a Damascene conversion to flat bars more recently when I realized that on a fixed gear, having all that extra leverage is actually really helpful and it's just more comfortable for riding around town as well. I'm rather partial to the shiny old school Shimano 105 road crank, which is fitted with a 1 8 inch track chain ring. It's actually running on the bottom bracket that this bike originally came with and which I've never removed from the frame so I can only assume that it's extremely stuck by this point. Overall the bike is really quite rusty and has been subjected to a lot of winter salt over the years. Another original component is the Cane Creek headset which I actually took apart a few years ago and it was absolutely perfect inside. It really is a beautiful bit of engineering that just seems to go and go forever. It amuses me that this rusty heap has some very fancy components on it as well, like this carbon railed Brooks Cambium saddle. On a practical note, I have this folding foldy lock permanently mounted on the front bottle cage mounts, which is really useful for popping to the shops. The leather carrying strap was an addition on an old commute I had that involved regularly walking up a flight of stairs with the bike and it just made it much easier to pick up. I've been meaning to change the fork for literally years. Obviously all the paint is flaking off, which doesn't really bother me that much. But also being a road fork, the geometry is wrong and it's dropping the front end of the bike down quite a bit. It also has nowhere near enough clearance, really. I've got 30 millimeter tires on the bike at the moment and the front one is actually rubbing on the fork, which is probably not that safe, but I just haven't got around to do anything about it. The logical thing to do would probably be to put a disc fork 
on this bike, but I just haven't worked up the enthusiasm to spend any money on it because basically I don't do journeys longer than about two miles on it most days. I get to ride some fantastic bikes in the course of doing my job at Bike Radar, but none of them have the sentimental value of my On One Pompino. It may be a total heap of rust, but it's mine and that's what matters. I'm never going to sell it. In our last episode of Bike Radar Builds, we asked you, our beloved audience, to submit your custom builds via the hashtag BikeRadarBuilds for your chance to be featured in the next episode. Some really wonderful bikes were submitted and I have to say we all thoroughly enjoyed looking through what you've been tinkering on at home and also kind of talking through your spec choices and why you made them. Now, it was incredibly hard to pick out one bike, but we must make a special mention to Adrian and his homemade wooden bike, which is affectionately known as Planky. This was as a result of Adrian and a bunch of his riding buddies who decided to create a series of mountain bike challenges with two simple rules. No bike could cost more than 25 pounds and no bike could be a mountain bike. There are no electronic group sets to be seen on this bike. Instead, it is made from old skirting board and last year's Christmas tree. Planky has evolved considerably over the years and Adrian even went as far as entering a local hill climb on the bike. Now we didn't win, but we admire the dedication. Now moving over to a rather special bike, we have Don Gwen's incredible Trek Supercaliber. Now I am so sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong. Please forgive me. Now this custom build really did make us look twice, but it was clear from the offset that this was no run-of-the-mill supercaliber, if there even is such a thing. Now, first off, you will notice that the bike has drop bars and some really interesting gearing choices, courtesy of the interdiscipline compatibility of SRAM's AXS group set family. To find out more, we asked on a few questions to find out more about this mountain bike, or is it a gravel bike? Or is it even a road bike? Let's find out. Now the Trek Supercaliber is already one of the lightest full suspension mountain bike frame sets on the market, but critically, its geometry is one of the closest to a typical road or gravel bike. Now starting the build, we have a mix of SRAM's AXS family components. Up front, we have SRAM Red AXS drop bar shifters, which is paired with the mountain bike XX1 rear derailleur, which gives you really, really huge range, but you can still shift with those drop bars. AXS can speak to each other, whether it's road or mountain bike. We've also got some very wide flared Easton EC70 handlebars. A RockShox SID fork was specced up front, which was also paired with a reverb AXS dropper. So if the Zill didn't work out and he didn't like the drop bars, he could still switch to a normal flat bar cross country bike. Now Don runs two different sets of tires on this bike. For off-road riding, he runs a WTB Riddler in a 45mm width. For road riding, he goes for a slick 44mm wide Rennie Hurst tyre. Now of course, I'm sure you're all wondering, how does it ride? And it's something I'm also wondering myself. Now, in Don's words, he says that in making a full suspension road bike, it also turns out you make a pretty damn capable gravel bike, but it's not without its unforeseen side effects. Now Don says it's very stable at high speeds on the road as well as off-road, but he says that the narrower drop bars compared to a flat bar do mean the steering is a little bit slower overall. Don has also switched to a 650B wheel set to better improve the road handling, but this did also drop the bottom bracket considerably, which if you're riding off-road isn't ideal. Now just because this does look quite a lot like a mountain bike doesn't mean that Don hasn't done some serious road rides. Key among his achievements on this bike looks to be a very, very, very wet Festive 500. Thank you very much to Don for sharing his bike with us and to everybody else who submitted their bike. Let us know in the comments what you think of suspension on road and gravel bikes. And again, submit any of your bikes that you would like to possibly see featured in a future episode using the hashtag BikeRadarBuilds. 
Once again, thank you so much to everybody that submitted their bike and thanks to my beloved, beautiful colleagues for sharing theirs. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, leave your thoughts in the comments and slap that bell icon so every time we upload a video like this, you'll get a notification.